I grew up in a house and music was always on the radio. My mom loved music. My father loved music. My older sister played the cello and my older brother played the violin. And as the youngest, I was the lucky one who got to play the viola. My mother had met the great Viennese violist Paul Doctor before she was married and they kept in touch. And one day she wrote to him and said, your godson has been born and we named him Paul after you. And we developed a very close relationship over the years. There was this constant feeling of, oh, that's your godfather, Paul Doctor. Oh, do you want to hear his recording of this or his recording of that? And so there was that influence, not all the time, but it was sort of in the periphery of, oh, there's always that Paul Doctor who you were named after, who plays the viola and you play the viola. So this feeling of my destiny, my destiny that I was named after Paul Doctor, my destiny of playing the viola because of him. And somehow I think that inspired me to work hard and to try to find my voice with the viola. After studying with a local teacher in Los Angeles, I was very fortunate to be able to work with Alan Deverich, who was a former student of William Primrose. I was getting the Primrose, uh, Franco-Belgian method as they call, through Izai Primrose, and then went to Alan, and then went to me. That started me thinking about the great old players like Fritz Kreisler and the romantic approach that is so present in some of those older musicians became part of my soul perhaps by listening to them, by having this primrose influence. And as I started working with other musicians who maybe weren't of that same mindset, I realize perhaps there's a line of how far you can go with that kind of playing and when it's appropriate. I came to New York at age 16 and went to the Juilliard School to work with Paul Doctor and at the same time was playing competitions and playing various concerts and after I graduated I was invited to audition for the New York Philharmonic principal job and I was fortunate enough to land that job at age 21. Can you imagine being content staying with the New York Philharmonic for, for many, many years? At this point, I really enjoy the orchestra very much, and I don't see why I couldn't stay there the rest of my life. I, I don't know what's gonna happen. I was playing in the New York Philharmonic for half a dozen years, and it was very inspiring and the music was great, but at a certain point, it seemed like I had to make a choice because besides doing the Philharmonic, I was spending every other minute playing other solo or chamber music concerts. I knew I couldn't sustain that kind of schedule. The artistic director of the Chamber Music Society at that time, Fred Sherry said, Paul, would you like to join our roster, and the roster of the society was less than 20 people at that point. When I joined the Chamber Music Society, I was joining a group, and as being part of this small group, I got to know the other players more intimately, some I'd never known before, I got to know their playing, and the past connections and the current connections of when I joined all came together, and you could say there is a sense of family and intimacy when you're playing chamber music that happen in this group as well. So here you've got your history at CMS. Right. This is, this is your first Tully concert right here. Oh, wait, where? I think it's fair to say that I've performed more concerts than anybody at the Chamber Music Society since I've been playing here for so many years and I'm just looking through this repertoire that I've played and there are so many memories. There's some really great repertoire over the years. 
Every performance, you're making new memories, and that's part of the history of your performance of any work. All those performances, all those collaborations are all building up to the next performance. So you're informed by your past experience with the various performers, and so this is what makes every performance unique because you're changing and your experiences are changing. This is part of what makes chamber music so invigorating and so personal. Wow, look at Claire. I suppose you could say that family has been a big part of my upbringing because I started with my brother and sister all playing string instruments. Then I joined this Primrose de Verich and Izai Franco-Belgian family and then Paul Doctor and then the Chamber Music Society. In a sense we became family. And then on a personal level my wife Carrie McDermott who I met in the New York Philharmonic. We have two children who play the violin, and Carrie plays the violin, so we have a musical family. We have three violins and viola, and not your most usual string quartet family, but it's a string quartet. We have a choice. We can do Danilo, we can do Schubert, we can do Elgar. When the musical life changed for all musicians, when we couldn't play concerts, the quartet became more important. We made videos and trying to figure out how to work the cameras and the sound equipment. And all these things bring the family more together and it gives a community goal of the household, which was very positive for us. As a parent, it brings gratification and joy to see your children become adults from when they were young playing to wonderful artists in their own right. I look back to my own upbringing and my own voice, and I can see for them the influence from their parents and from their peers at school and from their teachers, how they're evolving as players. and to perhaps be influenced by me with my dedication to the older players and older style is gratifying. It's wonderful to see the old style be able to continue. And if I had a small part in this by passing it on to my kids, and they'll perhaps pass it on to their children if they play or to their colleagues that they work with, that makes me feel good.